coming up on Garden Talk. With native soil, it really has very low organic matter and it's more mineral content and that is what our nutrients are. So implementing native soil is really a way of just unlocking like a savings account of nutrients. Rice holes are amazing for aeration instead of pumice or vermiculite because rice holes hold water, they break down, and they are 90% silica. Worms are resilient. I left my worms for a year one time. I forgot that I had a whole tote of worms and I went out there and they're still alive. A year later, I didn't even touch them. 40% of all landfills could be composted at home instead of throwing your food away in the trash where it's gonna get buried in a piece of plastic in a landfill, turn into methane, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, you fed your plant with it. You're saving money and you're saving the planet. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Dog Podcast. This is episode number 30. In this episode, I interview Queen of the Sun Grown. She has been gardening for 11 years and grows a variety of plants, such as tomatoes, potatoes, onions, buckwheat, marigold, carrots, beets, and so much more. In this episode, we focus on DIY gardening. She talks about things such as building up the native soil in your backyard versus buying bag soil, IPM, composting, and more. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast on Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast who help make that goal possible. Big shout out to Spider Farmer for sponsoring this podcast. Spider Farmer is well known to produce high quality LED grow lights at a price lower than nearly all other companies. They have board style LED grow lights, as well as bar style LED grow lights. I've used their SF1000, SF2000, and SF4000 LED grow lights in the past, and I got some excellent results with them. They also have grow tents, inline fans, and carbon filters. I will leave a link to Spider Farmer down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt5 during checkout for a discount on their products. AC Infinity is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code Mr. Grow It will get you a discount on their products. I've been using their Cloudline T6 and T4 inline fans for several years now, and I absolutely love the automation built into them. On the inline fans controller, you can have set points for high and low temperature, as well as high and low humidity. This greatly helps control my indoor garden environment, so the temperature and humidity stays in the ideal ranges. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and don't forget to use coupon code MrGrowIt for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is Dutch Pro. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their nutrients. I have been using their base nutrients formulated specifically for RO and soft water. I also have been using some of their additives like CalMag, Silica, and their root stimulator called Take Root. They have a few other additives on top of those, and pH regulators. Coupon code MrGrowIt10DP will get you a discount on their products. And I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. Okay, now let's get into the episode. All right, and we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Queen of the Sun Grown. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. So happy to be here. Yeah, happy that you joined. I think it was what, like a month and a half ago you reached out to me and... You talk about how you have experience doing, um, I know you're on podcasts before and you have a radio show and you've got all this good information about DIY gardening. We're going to get in this today. Uh, IPM, soil building, composting, just a whole bunch of different knowledge today. Uh, and I'm super excited on that one. So um, thanks for joining me. And um, for those that don't know who you are, can you just give us kind of an introduction, who you are and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Queen of the Sun Grown is my, um, you know, handle on Instagram and you can find me, um, there or on Patreon. Uh, I am a cannabis cultivator and consultant as well as a UC Davis trained master gardener. Um, my background is environmental science. So I went to school for natural science and prior to getting into the industry, I worked for the nature conservancy, um, doing invasive species management and endangered species. Um, and so basically I've just studied a lot of sustainable agriculture 
and ecosystem management. And I've just applied that to my life and really trying to educate my community and to how we can just be better humans living alongside plants and animals and working together and doing our thing. Nice, nice. Now, what's your growth style? Are you an indoor grower, outdoor? Do you grow in beds, containers, greenhouse? What do you What do? You do? So I learned how to grow inside. Um, I had a medical business back in medical days in California. And I mean, this was the typical indoor synthetic, like my partner just taught me use a bottle, this is what you do, follow a recipe, all the grow bro stuff. And at the time I was in college and I was learning about sustainable agriculture and ecosystems and how everything is connected. And I thought, this is a little strange, you know, like my lifestyle is all organic and here I am growing inside when I'm in California, which is, you know, the number one in the nation for agriculture outside. So when Prop 64 passed, I was actually forced to move in order to keep my business legal. And I moved down uh, the hill outside of Tahoe to grow and change my whole style to outdoor growing. And it was the best thing that happened to me because I am so happy I am not under grow lights anymore. <laughs> Uh, being outside in the sun is amazing. I grow in native soil. I'm a huge proponent of closed loop systems, regenerative agriculture, and using what you have on your land um, to benefit you the most um, without having to use a lot of money, um, inputs, and just trying to keep it as low cost and efficient as possible. Cool. Yeah. So we're going to get into the DIY type stuff today. Like I had mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I want to start with, which I thought was super cool was on your Instagram, you have this DIY rooting hormone. It's on your Instagram story. Can you talk to us about that real quick? Yeah, basically, um, I kind of like to go through all of the most popular, um, growing, uh, products and look and see what their active ingredient is and try and find that and do a cost analysis of what everyone's most popular, um, you know, so for rooting hormone, it is Clonex is what I used. And uh, indole 3 butyric acid is the active ingredient. And this is in the auxin hormone group for plants. And so that's responsible for cell elongation and is typically associated with root growth. Um, and that is found in most common um, rooting hormones. And so I just did a little research and I found a 99% pure um, indole 3 connected with potassium. Um, and that was about $27, I believe, for um, a ton. I mean, this is pure. This is like, I think it was five grams. Um, and it worked out to be a dollar thirty-seven per two hundred milliliters um, versus Clonex, which is thirty dollars for the same proportion. So you're literally saving. You know, you can use that. I'll probably have that little bag for the next five years. Yeah, that's so awesome that you're able to kind of save money that way. Yeah, I saw it was the two hundred milliliters is what your mixture kind of came out to was 05 percent IBA. And then the comparison was 100 milliliters of Clonex, 0.31%. So it's less IBA than what you're making. And you're paying a lot more than $30 oh, per. Yeah. So yeah. where can they get that IPA? Um, if you go to powergrown.com, they are a company out of Sacramento. And they provide all different kinds of plant hormones um, and things that you can purchase from them uh, in bulk powder that you just mix yourself. And so with this powder specifically, uh, you're gonna want to just make enough for what you're going to use. Okay, that makes sense. Nice, yeah, good little grow hack there. Quick grow hack, save some of you guys some money out there. I know there's a ton of people watching that love the DIY style stuff and saving money, so um, that's pretty cool. Let's flip it up. Let's talk about IPM. You know, I've seen your Instagram, you grow these massive plants outdoors. I'm mostly an indoor grower. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I have very little outdoor experience. 
indoors, outdoors, completely different battlefields, right? Um, when we talk about IPM, I mean, there's several grows that I've been through indoors where I haven't done any IPM, you know what I mean? You can got to get away with it sometimes if you have, as long as you're cleaning your grow room between and so on and so forth. Outdoors is a completely different battlefield. When you're growing outdoors, what do you usually do? What's your IPM routine? The first step in IPM for outside is really just letting go of the expectation that you're not going to have pests because you're going to. It's just that's part of nature, bugs, and really just learning about them, their life cycle, when to expect them, um, what they feed on, how many times they molt, um, you know, what their metamorphosis stage is, is really just about learning what to expect, um, what eats them, what they're attracted to, what predator insects, how you can attract them and really encouraging as many species as possible because biodiversity is really the key and so that you don't have an outburst of one species um, and you can really just keep a harmonious balance. Uh, this is done essentially through a lot of companion planting. Um, I do buckwheat, nasturtium, lemon balm, um, daikon radish, uh, and then a ton of other like pollinator habitat, just mixed wildflower seeds all around the property. Um, but those first few species I talked about, I actually use um, within my greenhouse. And so those border the edges of the greenhouse beds where my outdoor plants are. And those are all attractors for predatory wasps, hoverflies, um, ladybugs, and so a lot of those species, it's actually their larvae um, that are responsible for eating a lot of the pests like aphids, um, caterpillars, stuff like that. So really just encouraging a good thriving, healthy ecosystem um, is my first step of IPM. Then being out there, looking, look, uh, just seeing what's going on, observing, uh, and then definitely defoiling, removing leaves, just pull them off. Just get as many leaves as you can. I try to do a heavy defoil midway through each grow cycle. And then again, um, right before harvesting. And now how about sprays? Do you do any type of like sprays at all? Oh, yeah. Weekly, I know a lot of people do weekly sprays of. Yeah, depending on um, the pressure and the time of the year, I will do sprays. Um, I have a whole outline on my Patreon of different sprays that you can use for aphids specifically because that is a big um, pressure in Northern California is the aphid. For aphids, for instance, they really just need to be sprayed with something. They're soft-bodied insects, and so if you spray them with just water, that's fine. Um, and I like to use any opportunity I spray my plants, I use it as um, an opportunity to feed them at the same time. So silica is in there because silica penetrates the cell wall and that's a very good defense against pests, pathogens, fungal, um, anything that's going to attack the plant. If you have a stronger cell wall, your plant is stronger to resist that. So any spray I do, I start with silica. Um, and then there's a variety of different things depending on what I'm combating or what time of the year it is. Um, I like to use zombie spores, you know, the fungal spores that will um, infect the pest and kill them that way. Um, and so that those need to be used during the more humid time of the year. So maybe like later in the end of summer or early spring when there's more humidity. Um, during the middle of the summer when it's really hot and dry, those techniques aren't going to work as well. So it's really just about, you know, knowing your environment, what you've got going on, and then making the smart decision on what to spray. I really don't encourage um, using any pesticides, even if they are organic. Um, they accumulate in our waterways, uh, they get eaten and bioaccumulate up the food chain, and they can affect birds, they can affect all different species around you. So that's kind of like a last case scenario. And oftentimes they will wipe out a lot of the beneficial insects that you're using as your soldiers, you know, your first defense. And so you can have this big population growth of, let's say, your 
spraying a pyrethrum or something and you want to wipe out aphids, well, they're going to go ahead and they're going to wipe out all the aphids, but they may wipe out all the ladybug larvae as well. And a ladybug will reproduce only so many, um, you know, eggs hatch in so much time, whereas an aphid can give birth to four live births a day. So you can see this explosion afterward of your pest and then your predators that got killed off are having a harder time catching back up. So really try to stay away from pesticide sprays, even if they are organic. That's good information. Aphids, they're, uh, they're a pain. I had them on my outdoor garden one year. And, uh, oh, well, first of all, I got lazy with the IPM, so I didn't spray like I should have. Got all the way up to harvest day. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to bok choy tonight. Go outside, and they're just loaded with the aphids. Yeah. Loaded. The lettuce was fine right next to it. But the aphids, they were just buried in as deep as they could kind of be within the, the leaves of the bok choy. And that was disappointing. So um, don't slack when it comes to IPM, uh, especially outdoors, because uh, it's just it's not a good feeling when the bugs like are just all over your plants, right? No. <laughs> also remember, you're 10%. Uh, it's kind of like tithing, you know, permaculture is that 10% rule that 10% of your garden, you should just expect to give it back to Mother Earth, give it back to the pests. That's a good saying. I don't think <laughs> I've ever even heard that before. <laughs> now, how about root aphids? I know you've encountered those before, and those aren't something I'm very familiar with. Can you talk to us about root aphids and yeah. what you did to combat them? Yeah. Um, root aphids are a pain in the butt because they often... Um, go unnoticed for a long time because they are in the roots and that's not something that you're looking at. Um, and so typically you start seeing what looks like a magnesium deficiency in your leaves that, you know, Christmas tree pattern, the intervenal chlorosis, and you're like, oh no, am I deficient? This is so crazy. Why? What's going on? And then you find little tiny things crawling around in your root zone, and um, that's what happened for me. I finally took a plant out to look at it because I knew there was no way I could be deficient, and I found them, lo and behold, and basically I thought, well, I looked up what eats root aphids. Um, rove beetles are amazing, super fast. If you watch them, they're like running through your soil, looking for things, hunting. They're like vicious little killers. So getting rove beetles um, in there, either purchasing them. I've never actually purchased any predatory insects. I just plant um, plants to attract them um, and create that habitat. But the rove beetles, and then I, act, I did purchase nematodes. So I just got the triple threat from Arbico Organics and inoculated my beds and everything with the nematodes, uh, I'm sorry, the nematodes. And then I did use a uh, nemix as well, a root drench, and that was only in the plants that were in pots with root aphids. I wouldn't recommend um, doing a root drench in your living soil beds um, if you have those beneficials like the rove beetles and stuff like that in there. Um, but if you are in a small container using something like Nemix, um, which is uh, from the azadiractin, you know, based pesticide, it is organic. But again, all of those things I talked about apply to organic pesticides as well. Um, but I had really good success with that. Um, and then there's this thing called um, Bassania. Bovaria, I'm probably butchering that. Um, so that's a strain of fungus that you can also use and that will combat root aphids. So the common name is Botanigar WP22, I believe, and it's the product that carries that strain. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Let's flip it up. Let's stop talking about bugs and let's talk about <laughs> soil building. Kind of gets into the DIY type of thing. I know a lot of growers, they... They go to their local hydroponic store and they buy bag soil, right? Potting soil. Now you specialize in just using the native soil, right? The soil in your backyard yep. and kind of reviving that. Can you talk to us about how somebody would kind of go about doing that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the thing with potting soil in a bag 
it's really not soil. That's potting mix. Um, it is mostly organic matter. And that organic matter is going to be used up within one cycle, pretty much. You, you can pretty much guarantee that by the end of that growing season, your plant is going to have extracted everything out of that bag of soil that it can. Um, with native soil, um, it really has very low organic matter and it's more mineral content and that is what our nutrients are. Um, so implementing native soil is really a way of just unlocking like a savings account of nutrients and in order for you to do that, you just have to build up the organic matter because that's what you're lacking. So poop of any form, like, you know, if you have access to um, the Resource Conservation District in your county, you can get a hold of them and they will actually deliver free manure to your house. Um, if you know anyone with a horse or a cow, you can literally, I've knocked on my neighbor's door and said, hey, can I bring a wheelbarrow over and shovel some of your poop out of your yard for you? And they're like, yeah, go ahead. Um, composting, that is a huge way of reducing your waste. 40% um, of all landfills could be composted at home. Imagine your carbon footprint being reduced by just, instead of throwing your food away in the trash where it's going to get buried in a piece of plastic in a landfill, turn into methane, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, you fed your plant with it. You're saving money and you're saving the planet. It's like win-win right there. Um, so basically, whatever form of organic matter you can get, get your hands on it. Um, cardboard. I went to a waste reclamation center and the number one thing being thrown away is packaging. Amazon, think about it. you get a box within a box within a box. If you can break down all of your cardboard, you can use that to build your soil. Literally, that's carbohydrates. Your plants will, that will create soil for you. Um, so you've got manure, you've got cardboard, you've got kitchen waste, um, and then, you know, your uh, compost, another form you can use is worms. Worm composting is super easy no matter where you live. If you're in an apartment, you can have a worm bin. And the thing with worms is whatever they eat comes out seven to 11 times richer. So if you feed your worms, you know, something with a three, 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 you know, you're saying in ratio of NPK, it's going to be a higher ratio, like 21, 21, 21. So that doesn't happen often in nature. Usually the energy taken, you lose energy as you go through a, a, a chemical reaction or something like that. But with worms, in this case, you're actually going to get more out of them than you put in. And worms are resilient. I mean, I left my worms for a year one time. I forgot that I had a whole tote of worms. And I went out there, and they're still alive. A year later, I didn't even touch them. Like, <laughs> so if you're a hands-off gardener, worms are an amazing option for building up your soil and just getting a hold of as much organic matter as you can. That's really the key. Um, so taking, you know, what people would consider as trash, that becomes your plant's food. And there are definitely things that you need to take into consideration um, when assessing your location for building the soil. And um, I wrote an eight page paper on this recently. So if you're interested in the details of how to analyze your native soil for things like pH, um, organic matter that is there already, their NPK, uh, the drainage, because that's gonna be a huge issue with growing depending on your, um, if your soil is silt, clay, um, or sand, it's gonna affect how they hold on, how it holds on to nutrients, um, how the water drains through it. And there are many ways you can determine this at home. You don't need a fancy soil test kit. Um, you don't need to send it to a lab. You can just do things through observation, feel, um, and a few other little tests to just determine what kind of soil you have and then how you can build it up. I'm just thinking about my soil back in, uh, I used to live in Massachusetts. And uh, just thinking about the house I grew up in, parents' backyard. Digging down, there's sand, and it seems like there's a lot of clay too. So I always thought like that that can't be used at all with with uh, medicinal plants because of. You know, I, I think it's well known even amongst intermediate and beginners that 
there needs to be aeration down in the root zone and having a real compact medium plants don't thrive as well now are you saying that i could potentially revive that oh yeah sand and clay Uh and turn it into something that okay clay is actually like one of the best soil types you can have because it is the smallest particle size it has the highest cation exchange capacity the those Particles that are so tiny, yes, they contribute to compaction and lack of aeration, lack of drainage, but they are more readily available, accessible nutrients because the particle sizes are so small. So really what you need to do is grow some carrots, potatoes, daikon radish, grow as much as you can and let it die. Don't harvest it. You just throw seeds out there. They're really cheap. And as it grows and it breaks up, then you're building your organic matter. You're breaking up your compaction of that clay, that hard, dense pack. And in a season, you can change it around. Wow, that's really good info. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. There are going to be some people that are watching this that don't want to wait that season. Do you recommend people using um, you know, their, their native soil in their backyard and amending it with some of these blends that are out there, maybe Dr. Earth blend or build a soil blend or anything like that? Do you recommend going that route or, or not really? Um, no, I don't really. I think that um, if you want, so clay specifically is one of those soils that will take you know, your time doing it the way that I suggested. But if you don't want to wait, then you can use a tiller. I know that I there's this whole thing of no-till, till, but in this scenario, if you have a lot of compaction and you want to grow immediately, I would recommend getting a small, renting a small tiller and breaking, or a, a hand uh, pickaxe, that's what I've used, if you have the muscles and you're willing to put in the work, um, and you break that up, and then buy a yard of bulk compost from someone. You can buy a bag of this soil mix that you're talking about, but truly, I mean, it's probably expensive. It's in, you have to ship it to you. And most people have local soil yards where um, you can buy a truckload of soil, a compost made there in your hometown for like $40 um, for an entire yard. And that, I don't know how much those bags are that you, um, suggested but usually a bag of soil is like what three cubic feet and they're like 10 to 15 dollars sometimes 20 dollars for a bag so how many bags i'm just thinking if you're going for efficiency you want to grow something right away really just getting some good quality compost from a local source um is probably your best bet because those bags often have a lot of vermiculite, pumice, lava rock, stuff like that, that doesn't mix really well with clay, that comes to the top as you water it. Um, So if you're going to use native soil, I recommend just getting clay compost from a local source and using a tiller so that you can till in the compost with your native soil or the pickaxe or whatever one of those um, handheld you know when I'm talking about the three teeth um, prong things that you step on and work in with I, I don't know the name of it but that thing um, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean so the thing is that the the drainage is going to be completely different in a bag of potting mix to to clay and so if you just buy a bunch of potting mix and you put it on top of your native soil you're going to get a hard pan layer because well sure, sorry sorry let me uh I was referring to the not not actual potting soil from bags, but more like the the nutrient blends. Like down to earth makes a lot of those uh, amendments, like having those amendments, but oh, they're yeah. actually a blend of amendments. That's what I meant. Okay, more, yeah. more of that instead of the potting soil. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know what you were referencing. I apologize. Yes, I use down to earth um, and mix that in. Definitely um, knowing what's in your soil a little bit, like. Um, If you know that you're devoid of nutrients and you need to add things, mend your native soil. Definitely. I amend my native soil with um, like a a sea blend of like crab, shrimp, oyster, um, with different mycorrhizal inoculants, bacteria, 
um, rice holes are amazing for aeration instead of pumice or vermiculite because rice holes um, hold water, they break down, and they are 90% silica. So there you go, you're adding more of that to your plants' um, nutrients. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely amend it. I'm not saying don't amend um, because especially in a medicinal crop that eats a lot and if you're trying to get multiple cycles out um, in a growing season, you're, you're going to want to replenish. Um, and especially if it's brand new uh, native soil that you're just building up because in order to, in, to access all of the nutrients, you have to have microbes there and create that habitat and get that living soil web going. And so you're, if you know, you're talking about people who want to start growing right away. Um, you're not, it's not going to be unlocked right away. That's the thing. Minerals need to be um, cycled. They need to become soluble. And so with native soil, you have an unlimited supply of them, but you need to figure out how to unlock them. And so using nutrients up front, you know, your down to earth blends or your um, build a soil or whatever it is that your favorite is. I have a local um, farm supply store that makes their own fertilizer. I try and always support local as much as possible. So definitely, you know, do that. Um, and yeah, but you're going to be able to spend a lot less money on amendments um, using your native soil versus mixing in potting soil, you know. Great point for sure. Absolutely. Now, soil testing. Um, I know you you said earlier you don't really have to do the soil testing side of things. Some viewers, they're going to want to do the soil testing yeah. when they're building up their native soil. Can you talk to us a little bit about like the testing side of things, you know, macronutrient content or whatever? Yeah, definitely. Um, like I said, I literally just published an eight-page paper on testing, doing your own home testing. And so it goes through everything that you can do at home to do these tests. It even links products where you can buy um, like a at-home NPK test and pH test. Um, and it describes how to do these with uh, a thing called a slurry test. And so basically you're going to um, take a glass jar you know, like a mason jar with a lid, and uh, dig down about eight inches in your native soil, and make sure your hands are clean, your tools are clean, that there's no um, way that any fertilizer could be on those uh, tools, because that will skew your test for sure. Um, and take a little bit of that soil and fill your jar up about a third of the way, and then fill the rest of the jar with distilled or dechlorinated water. Um, and go ahead and give that a big old shake and let it sit for a while um, until it settles. And so you can go ahead and buy an at-home NPK test or if you have your pH pen and you can use the uh, solution in that jar and use a little test strip and you can find out um, general area of your macronutrients as well as your pH of your soil through this little at-home test. And I mean, like 30 minutes, you'll be able to find out at least um, if your soil can sustain some life and where, what direction you need to build it in, what you need to amend it with. Um, other than that, um, it's really a generalization. I don't know if you've used those tests, the little uh, like strips, you put it in the water um, and it'll tell you. I use them for my pool. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, it's good. It's basically the same idea and it'll sh give you like a color scale of how, you know, low, moderate, ex excessive of nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. Um, but your micronutrients, really your micronutrients, you should have a decent amount of micronutrients in all native soil because micronutrients are come from rocks, you know, you think calcium, magnesium, manganese, boron, copper, that's all like from rocks. So uh, it should be there. Um, other places are going to have more uh, available than others. Like if you live near in glacial territory, you think about people order glacial rock dust. If you live in a glacial valley, you probably have freaking awesome micronutrients in your soil. 
Um, if you live by a volcano, you have that people get volcanic ash. They order it to, you know, basalt that. So if you just know a little bit about where you live, um, you could have like a gold mine of nutrients right under your feet and you didn't even know it. Just doing a little bit of research and putting that effort in to getting to know your soil goes a long way and will save you a ton of money. That's awesome. Yeah, really good information there. Appreciate you sharing that one. Yeah. Let's flip it up. Let's talk about composting. So we kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but I want to get deeper into it. I don't compost. I'm uh, so I guess we want to kind of speak more on beginners' terms, <laughs> right? What you said earlier kind of intrigued me. The forty per what do you say? Forty percent of yeah. waste could be composted, yeah, 40 which is pretty crazy. Of landfill could be composted. And all it does takes, this is the why I'm doing what I'm doing, talking to people. I could just sit at home and grow my medicinal herbs and make my money and go my own way, but I want to get it out there. It's our responsibility to take care of this planet and our responsibility to take care of our waste. It's not the government's, you know, look at what they're doing. I'm not going to go on a rampage here, but we are the ones who make the biggest change. And so composting is one thing everyone can do at home. Um, and there's so many different varieties. And so basically, you need to ask yourself, how much time do you have? What resources do you have available to you? And those could be like your space, um, how much room you have, uh, how much waste you produce. Um, if you, you know, just figure out how much you want to invest into your composting system, and then that will gauge what level of composting you want to get into. You can be as simple, like I said, on the simplest scale would be um, worms. That's literally the easiest way. You don't have to do anything. You just get a little tote from Home Depot, take a quarter inch drill bit, drill some holes in the bottom for drainage, drill some holes at the top for air, put the lid on, uh, shred some paper, throw it in there, get a pound of red wigglers, um, and those are the ones you want for composting because they live in the top soil and they, um, the top six inches, and they are really, really good. They eat their weight like every day in food. So if you, for every square foot of worms you have, you want one pound of food. So just take that into consideration of how much um, kitchen scraps you've got going on and how many worms you need. But you can put them, you could do it in the tote, in the rectangular tote, or you can do it in a five gallon bucket. You can leave it in your garage. It doesn't smell. Um, just make sure that it is somewhere um, that if it leaks out the bottom that you're okay with it. Maybe you put a saucer underneath, um, just be aware of that. But that is literally like the easiest way to compost. If you want to um, take it up a notch and start, you have a lot more that you have available to compost. If you've got a big yard with lots of yard clippings um, or a garden where you're constantly weeding um, or if you're growing medicinal herbs and you're deleafing a lot um, and you have those materials accessible, then maybe you want to get a little bit bigger and you want an actual compost pile in your yard, um, depending on what kind of pests you have around, if you've got like raccoons or bears. Um, I live in the country, so these are things I have to worry about with compost. But if you're in a neighborhood where you don't have to worry about that, then you can have it a little bit more open. Um, so either you need to have it enclosed if you have pests, or you can have it open if you're not worried about that. You can just have a pile. Um, and the rule of thumb for composting is uh, 30 parts of nitrogen to one part carbon. So nitrogen materials would be your green, your kitchen scraps, your grass clippings, your leaves, things of that nature. Your carbon is your dried grass, um, your dead leaves, um, wood chips, all of the cardboard that you have from Amazon, that's all carbon. And so you don't have, it doesn't have to be exactly 30 to one. This is just a nice ratio of the optimal ratio. Um, and the way you can determine this is just having equal volume. So if you have a five gallon bucket of kitchen scrap, then a five gallon bucket of dry leaves or dry grass, and that would be about 30 to one ratio. So combine those 
mix them up and all you need is a little air, a little water, and a little time and you've got compost. You make it sound a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. And you, it depends on how much time, like I said, how much time you want to put into it. Some people are like, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to turn my compost pile every day and I'm going to water it. And in four weeks I have black gold or like me, I have so many things going on. I have a three compartment system. And so basically I have, um, you know, one compartment is I'm adding to it all the time. I'm just throwing my kitchen scraps. And what I like to do is when I go to the grocery store, I get a paper bag and I use the paper bag for throwing all my kitchen scraps in. And then your paper bag is your carbon right there. You just take that paper bag and you throw it into your compartment. You're like, okay, bye, done. And you just keep adding, keep adding, keep adding. And then at, when you you finally you filled your compartment, which ideally three feet high by three feet wide is the ideal volume for um, getting the compost going. Um, so I get it up to that point and then I start watering it and I don't add to it. Um, if I have old compost, I will cover the top of it with old compost or I have goats and chickens so I can cover it with the manure and really just covering that um, kind of locks in the moisture and gets things kick-started and adds the heat and gets the bacteria going and moving, um, brings in the microbes from the old compost or manure, or manure and really gets things moving fast. Um, and just making sure you water it is really, you know, once a month. It, and if it rains where you're at, you know, then you don't even have to water it. Just maybe go put a stick in there and move it around and make sure it doesn't stink. If it starts stinking, then you're gone, you've gone anaerobic and you need more oxygen. Um, but really, just if you have a pitchfork or a shovel, go and turn it once a month and within four months you'll have compost. It's not hard. It, everyone can do it. I was going to buy one of those uh, vermicompost bins with the multiple layers. And I think they're actually like 100 bucks on Amazon. But now you mentioned I can just get a bin locally. I'll just buy a bin and do it that way. So when I'm adding stuff in to it, you could fill it all the way up and then just let the worms go nuts for four months, keep it moist. One thing I was worried about is temperature. At wintertime in my garage, it gets cold. It gets, you know, 40 degrees or so. Is it going to be like a slow of activity? Is there like a too cold of temperature to where? It'll just slow down in the winter. It'll slow down, but it's not going to stop. They're, you know... The red wigglers have a huge range of temperature. They'll survive down to like 20 degrees and up to 90 degrees. Um, and then they just stop reproducing. Once they get out of that boundary, they stop reproducing, but they're still alive. And the more you put in there, the more insulation it will have and protect them um, and keep things warm. And kind of on the upward side of temperature, I know it can't get too hot. And you've got to turn the piles every now and then. What's the kind of general rule for turning your compost piles? It, like I said, it depends on um, how fast you want the compost, how much time you have. If you want compost quickly, turn your pile once a week. And within four to six weeks, you'll have compost. If you don't have time to do that, if you do it once, it's still, no matter what, it's going to break down. It just depends on how fast you want it to, how much space you have. Um, I have a pile that I've only turned twice this year, but it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It started out like five feet tall and now it's two feet tall and it doesn't smell, nothing gets into it and it's just slowly breaking down. So it's really up to you and how quickly you want the compost accessible. If you're composting for nutrients and fertilizer or you're composting to reduce your carbon footprint and your waste, you know, there's a difference. So I hope you're gonna compost now. I really hope that I have convinced you that you will help save the world by composting. So next time we talk, you better have some worms or something at least. Okay. All right. I will. I, I'm more confident now because you break it down in more of a beginner friendly manner. I mean, it seems like there's so many people out there that just, it, it makes it so complex, but you have this talent to where you're able to explain it a little bit more easier <laughs> to where a guy like me can grasp it pretty easy. You know what I mean? Is, is more confident to start having the knowledge. So 
Um, yeah, I yeah. taught little kids how to com worm compost at the fair. So they learn, you can learn. <laughs> All right. And then do you have any other kind of tips for people that are new to composting? Um, you know, just keep on keep on adding things I, like just be don't don't limit yourself to what you read like how you said you weren't doing it because of a limiting belief that you thought it was all this complexity it's really it's a pile think of the forest we go and buy alaskan humus and what is that that is compost that took uh, thousands of years to break down all of the things in the forest floor, the poop, the leaves, the bark, the fish guts from the bears, and it just slowly did its thing. So composting is literally, it could be, it could take years or it can take weeks. So just play with it. And they say not to add like bones and meat and fat. I do. I don't care. I throw it in there and, um, I have five dogs, so they protect it from, like, you know, raccoons and stuff like that. So if you have, like I said, if you got those things, don't maybe don't throw in the tasty treats. Um, but don't be afraid. Just go ahead and try it and see what happens. Some people compost poop, like their own human manure. I am not a proponent of that. Uh, <laughs> now people are going to go take dumps in their compost piles after this. <laughs> So there's one more thing I want to talk about, which I thought was super interesting uh, before we end this podcast, which is gardening by the moon. Okay. So you plant according to different moon phases, huh? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, honestly, it's just interesting to me. Um, there, I believe it's Rudolf Steiner. Um, there's a French guy who came up with the whole biodynamic movement at the same time as the organic movement in the like 60s happened. And... The idea is that, um, you know, the moon cycle has different poles and gravity um, that affects water. It affects the tides. Um, and so when you have, you know, a new moon is supposedly a really good time to plant a seed because the gravitational pull of water is um, bringing water to the surface. And so if you're, you've sown your seeds outside during the new moon, it should stay moist longer because of the gravity. Um, and so I don't know if it's a hundred percent real or if it's a little woo woo, but you know, I figure our ancestors for the last 15,000 years, the advent of, uh, agriculture have been keeping track of time with the moon. And so why not go ahead and give thanks and work with mother earth and use what sh the tools that she has provided as easy as just the sky and why not do it and it's fun and I like reading my horoscope so why not plant my seeds with the new moon and harvest on the full moon so I don't know I don't know like biodynamic I've really I've, I've gone to a few workshops I actually went to a biodynamic composting workshop where these women literally butcher a cow on the full moon and they take the blood and drain the blood into a vase and ferment the blood and then take the ins the guts and stuff it with digestive medicinal herbs um, like chamomile and uh, comfrey and all different kinds of medicinal herbs and they put it in there and then they bury the intestines with these uh, digestive herbs and then they have the um, the blood fermenting, and then they go ahead and they compost all of this with the moon cycle, and then they're selling their supercharged biodynamic compost for eight hundred dollars a yard. I'm like, what? I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know about that. But it's out there. People do it. And just when you think you've heard about all the gardening techniques there are. You get slapped with something that's kind of absurd that you would never think was a, a thing, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Queen, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, I learned so much, uh, you know, about building soil, some cool DIY hacks, IPM, composting, which I promise I'll do <laughs> <laughs> before we meet next time for sure. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? 
Yes, you can find me on Instagram at Queen of the Sun Grown, um, and then Patreon, also Queen of the Sun Grown. Basically, everything that I talk about on podcasts and Instagram, I write down and give easy directions, videos, recipes on my Patreon, and um, I am using that to fund my own podcast because I love talking about gardening. And so the more support I get through Patreon, the more content I can create for people to save money and grow happier, better plants. Good stuff. I will link her Instagram and Patreon down in the description section below. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. Thumbs up button helps so much, helps us reach more people through the YouTube algorithm. Commenting also helps. If you found this to be valuable and you think somebody would benefit from this information, share it. Sharing is caring. I know there's a lot of people I've been sharing on Reddit lately and Facebook groups. So feel free to share this podcast. And if you're on Apple Podcasts in particular, please leave a rating and review. We passed 100, so super psyched about that. Thank you to everyone who has left a rating and review. Let's see if we can hit 200 ratings and reviews. That would be awesome. Queen, thank you so much for coming on once again. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you very much.